Let's take our Bibles this evening and turn to the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 14, and we'll look at verses 8 through the end of the chapter tonight. Acts chapter 14, verse 8 through 28, as we continue our study with through the book of Acts, and uh, really what's going to end up happening is Paul and Barnabas uh, are going to complete their first missionary journey. And uh, they're going to complete what God, uh, the work that God had called them to do. And uh, as we look, they start out in Antioch, and then they sailed down to Salamis, and to Paphos, and then up to Perga. And then they took about a um, hundred mile as the crow flies, which doesn't mean it means a straight shot. But uh, maybe, I don't know how the, from Perga up to Antioch was about a hundred miles as the crow flies. And then they went over, and last week we found them in Iconium, and they were, um, you know, not, get, not well received at Iconium. Remember, the whole city was divided. And we said that, you know, when you preach the gospel, uh, easy preaching divide. Uh, easy, I like what B.H. Carroll said, easy preachers can never divide a town. Uh, but these guys went in there and they preached the truth, and there was some division. And so uh, if that happens uh, as we share the gospel and live our lives as Christians, just... I might as well expect some of that. But uh, tonight we'll find out they're, they're going to make a, they're going to go on down to Lystra, uh, Lystra and Derby, and then they're just going to backtrack all the way back to Antioch. And um, so let's begin reading tonight in chapter 14 and verse 8 through 28. I think the, uh, the thought for tonight is going to come from verse number 26. And thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And I'm going to try tonight to drive those last five words home to our hearts, the work which they fulfilled. Uh, but let's begin reading in chapter 14, verse number 8. And there sat at, uh, a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, or Zeus, and Paul Mercurius, or Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes, that's a sign of Jewish time of blasphemy, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs! Why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he, hath, uh, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people, that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, how ironic, <laughs> a few minutes before they want to hail him as the God, as a God. And now they're stoning them, trying to kill them. Strange, this is. Having stoned, Paul drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter uh, into the kingdom of God. 
Just a side note, that does not mean the church is going through the tribulation. He's simply saying that as a Christian, you can expect uh, not an easy sailing. Uh, you can expect some tribulation. You can expect some trials. You can expect some pressures. It really goes, uh, flies in the face of the prosperity gospel of today. Uh, there is a type of preaching out there that says that, you know, you name it and claim it. Today is your day. Uh, God is all for you, and you'll not have any problems as a Christian. And yet right here, Paul goes to these folks and says, listen, there's going to be a lot of tribulation uh, before we enter into the kingdom of God. Well, yeah. I, I, in fact, I just was stoned the other day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Attalia, and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come, to, and, when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. And so this, this passage is simply the uh, story of Paul and Barnabas completing or fulfilling what God had called them to do at that time in their life. And that's what I want to get across to us tonight. Hey, are you doing what God has called you to do at this time in your life? That's a question. We all need to look in the mirror and answer, am I doing what God has called me to do? Am I, am I fulfilling uh, the work uh, that God has called me to do? Well, in their case, some of the particulars for the work they were doing uh, simply meant traveling around and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, as we see, they went from place to place. They, in Antioch, down to Salamis, Paphos, all the way up, and they kept on going, and they went around, and they preached the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. Verse number 7 it says, and there they preached the gospel. Folks, that is part of God's will for your life tonight. Uh, you and I are left on earth to preach the gospel, to share Christ uh, with those around us. Uh, had an opportunity last night, knocked on a young man's door, and uh, he's visited the church before and asked him, you know, have you thought any more about salvation? If you died, do you know where you would spend eternity? And he said, well, I try not to think about that. I get paranoid. I don't like to think about that kind of stuff. And he said, um, a friend of mine the other day told me that if I don't believe Jesus uh, is, died, was buried, and rose again, I'll go to hell. And he said, I don't really want to think about that. I said, well, let, uh, let me share with you the gospel. So I got out the Bible, amen. And we went down the Romans road about man is a sinner. There's, all, all, there's none righteous. No, not one. And uh, the consequence for sin is hell. The wages of sin is death. Your friend was telling you the truth. And we took him to Revelation 21.8, and it says, The fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters uh, and uh, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I mean, that's what awaits people uh, that do not anything uh, about their sin condition. And the sins that they have committed, if you go through this life and you don't humble yourself and trust Christ to be your Savior, uh, you're obligated to pay for those sins. And that person will pay for those sins uh, in hell for eternity. And so we shared that with him. And then I said, but I've got good news tonight. And we turn back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 and it says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Took him across the page. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death. Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death. Christ died for us. I mean, I'm talking about hammer it home. Let people know the truth. And we asked him, what's stopping you tonight from trusting Christ as your Savior? And he said, well, I just don't know that I can live the life. If I ask Jesus to save me, I might sin again. And I said, well, listen, once you receive Christ, you become a, his child. 
and you get the Holy Ghost. And you will sin again. Welcome to being a human. And that sin nature remains. It's not eradicated. There are some that would teach you or from then on you're sinless. Um, but my friends, you and I both know. <laughs> would anybody in here like to take the thoughts that you've had today and pl put them up on the, on the screen for all to see? I think not. <laughs> because we have uh, the sin nature in us. Uh, but anyway, he said... So we, we kind of answered some of those questions, and then we asked, would you like to trust Christ tonight as your Savior? He said, yeah, I would. And so I said, come on in my room, and we got, me and Boyd and him, we all got down on our knees about 8.30 last night, and he prayed uh, and asked Jesus Christ to save him. And it's worth it all, you know. Now, that's what we've got to be doing. Just, we've got to get over our fears, and we've got to trust the Holy Spirit, and, you know, just share the gospel with people. And don't worry about what's going to happen or what other people think. I mean, that's, just check that stuff at the door and serve God. And do like they did in verse 7. And there they preached the gospel. And so they were completing their work. They were fulfilling what God had called them to do. And, and I ask us tonight, are you fulfilling uh, that calling? Am I, are we busy sharing the gospel? Taking the opportunities that God gives us uh, to talk to people around us who are lost. Uh, they don't know Jesus. They're trusting in good works. And honestly, a lot of people, we live in 2017, it's not like it was back in the 1950s, a lot of people have never even heard the gospel. They have no idea of what is the gospel. I know this to be true because when I was on being ordained, uh, one of the pastors said, uh, Brother Danny, what is the gospel? And I said, well, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 talks about that, the death of the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And he said, you'd be amazed, young man, at how many people that are supposed to be ordained into the ministry don't know the answer to that. They don't even know what the gospel is. But I, So, those are preachers. <laughs> how much less the people that we meet from Kalamazoo, Michigan? They've never heard it. They, they, they may have heard about it or some kind of form or Jesus was on the cross, but I mean, they don't connect the dots. And you know the truth, and you have the truth, and God wants to use you. Listen to me tonight. God wants to use you uh, to reach people for Christ. Little as much <laughs> when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or vain. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go uh, in Jesus' name. But then... Uh, another particular fulfilling their work was uh, they had to deal with the heathen culture. <laughs> uh, they had to deal with heathen people, with people who thought they were gods, well, uh, with the crowd that was totally uh, immersed in idolatry. I mean, uh, this impotent man was healed, and the next thing, the priest of Jupiter, he's like, oh, great, we got Jupiter's actually here, whoa! And he gets, a, he gets some garland and ties around the ox's, uh, you know, the, the horns of the ox, and he's going to... Perform a sacrifice. Now this neat, uh, and it, I think it's instructive for us, a nice pattern for us to follow, uh, that Paul and Barnabas didn't run out there and say, uh, no, let me tell you, let me quote to you some Deuteronomy. They didn't do that with the heathen. Now when they were in the synagogues, they did that. Uh, because they had a nice starting point with the Jews. I mean, folks, they, they took the Bible, Paul did, and would make application directly. But here and in also in Acts chapter 17, when they're in Athens, Greece, where it's totally uh, idol worship, Paul starts from creation. Maybe this is a good way to start with people in Japanese, when you meet people from a totally non-Judeo-Christian type background. It's a good place to start. Hey, how did, God, how did God form the world, or how did the world happen? Mr. Shinto man, Mr. Buddhist man. Uh, what, hey, Mr. Krishna worshiper of, you know, all that. Maybe a good place for us to start basing, basing it from the pattern in Scripture is, hey, have you ever considered how the world really began? But that, that would cause us, we need to know how the world began. Uh, it's not by some big bang. <laughs> I was talking to Bo the other night, and he was saying, you know, the, uh, there's a, his way, there's some guy who is an apologist, uh, apologist, and all he does is he says, well, that's not what God said. 
well, how do you know there was no Big Bang? Well, because God said there was no Big Bang. <laughs> and that's all the reason that he gives, and it really frustrates the people. Well, how do you know uh, that Buddha and those are not the real God? Well, oh, because God said they're not the real God. <laughs> the real God said that there's no Big Bang, and the real God said that those aren't gods. Well, how do you know? Oh, how do you know? Well, God said. <laughs> and, he just, and he just witnessed to people like that. And so maybe that's how we can do. You know, folks, the, uh, tell you, the people in, uh, that you run into, God created the world. In the beginning, God created. Well, how do you know? Oh, um, well, he said he did. That's how I know. <laughs> nothing, you don't need nothing more, nothing less. God is pre, he presupposes. He doesn't come into it in Genesis 1 and try to explain himself. He just comes in and says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Right. And just believe it. And so they were dealing with heathen culture and opposition being stoned. And then another part of their uh, ministry, uh, look at verse number 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming or strengthening the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Part of their ministry uh, was a ministry of encouragement and discipleship. Now when they started out at Antioch and were going out, it was, they were preaching, um, they were trying to, they were preaching the gospel. Their ministry was converting people. But when they got to the end and started coming back around, uh, their ministry turned into confirming people. Uh, they went out preaching, they came back in confirming and discipling people and encouraging them uh, and strengthening them. Hey, listen, that is a great ministry uh, for each and every one of us in this church. Uh, we have visitors come in. We could be a total blessing to them. I mean, you could make it every opportunity to not come shake my hand, but go shake the visitor and say, man, I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming to church. This is a wonderful church and just encourage them and exhort them and be the type of a person who's involved in discipleship and be the type of person that's involved in encouragement. What a necessary ministry uh, that these guys fulfilled. That was part of their, they were completing uh, the work of God in their life. Uh, they went out preaching the gospel. They went out dealing with different cultures. And they came back uh, with discipleship and encouragement. And then finally, um, they reported to their sending church. Look at verse number 27. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. Not what they had done, but how that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And so their ministry, they went back to their supporting church. They finally got back to Antioch in Syria and they reported to that church. This is what God did with us while we were out. I got stoned. Wow, Paul, you've got a bunch of bruises on you. What happened? Your face, your, your lips all busted up. He said, yeah, that was from the stoning that I got. But a man was healed and, uh, well, one town hates us now, you know. <laughs> They're divided. And, but as you'll find out in, in Lystra, there was a man who got saved there. His name was Timothy, praise the Lord. And he became uh, a real servant of the Lord. I mean, they reported to their church. And so uh, that's one thing missionaries do today. Every so often, like maybe in next year or so, we'll probably go back to the States and there are some ch churches that support us. And my, well, I have a sending church, Radford, Virginia, Gethsemane Baptist Church. Uh, my family will go back there and, and we'll tell them uh, the wonderful things that God's done here. You know, I'll tell them about the Storman family. Tell them about Katharina. Tell them about the Hemfield family. I mean, all of you. You know, I'll just tell them, this is what God's doing in our life. I mean, God does it. And it's a joy. Hey, it's a joy to go back and report to a church what God's doing in your life. Now, I ask this question. What's God doing in your life? If you had to give a report tonight of what God is doing in your life, would you have anything to report? Uh, could you say, this is what's been going on, or... Uh, this is what I read in my Bible, or I'm really praying about this situation, or I saw God do this in a direct answer to my prayer. I mean, God is working. And we ought to be able to give those kind of reports, I think. I think that's just natural. 
uh, for the child of God. Not saying it's a bed of roses, folks, because uh, he told those guys, you're going to pass through a lot of tribulation. You're going to have to go through times of testing, and you're going to have to go through pressure is really what the idea of the word is, a pressure. Uh, and we, we will go through some of that. If you haven't experienced it already, I mean, you know, it'll, it'll come. But God is faithful. That's a beautiful thing. Look, they trusted, uh, verse number 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Now, we would probably look at that and say today with our, with our mission sense, we would say, well, you shouldn't do that. You can't uh, let baby Christians take over a church. You can't do that. Well, whose way is it? Our way or is we going to do what Paul did? I mean, they hadn't been saved long. And he came back through there and he commended them to the Lord. He turned them over. He handed them over uh, to God. And he just trusted, hey, he trusted uh, that God had begun a good work in them and would fulfill that work. And these people knew God and they had repented of their sin. They turned from following Jupiter and, uh, and uh, Mercurius. And now they trusted in Jehovah, in Jesus, which is called the Christ, the man of Nazareth who died once and for all on Calvary for their sin. They had a relationship, and the Holy Spirit lived in them, and he simply prayed with them and commended them, gave them over, handed them over to the Lord. And he trusted that God would do a work in their life. And so that's, uh, that's what these guys were doing, and uh, they were fulfilling. I like verse 26, those last five words there, the work which they fulfilled the work which they fulfilled well, what of it well I ask this question and we'll be done do individual Christians have a work to complete do we have a work to complete now some I uh, would say that no an individual Christian does not have any responsibility and the reason I say that uh, is because a lot of Christians, uh, it's not what they say, but it's more what they do. And their actions speak louder than the words. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. But what are you doing for the Lord? And it's crickets, it's quiet. And so by, by not doing anything, it, it's almost saying, no, I don't believe there's any responsibility to a Christian. I don't believe I have anything to do. There's no, there's no work for me to do. There's no work for me to fulfill. Uh, but the Bible says here in verse number 26, those last five words, uh, the work which they fulfilled. Uh, these people, they don't believe that, that Christians have a work to do. Maybe they say that the church is a hospital for hurting people. That's all church is. It's a hospital for hurting people. Now, I don't, um, you know, I understand that thought. But for me, personally, I don't find that in Scripture. I find rather in Scripture uh, that we are a body of believers who have been saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God and who have been commissioned by the Son of God to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize them, and teach them uh, the, the things concerning Christ. I also find the Scriptures call us the body of Christ. I also find that the scriptures say that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I know it's, it, but it, this idea that uh, we're just a hospital for hurting broken people, it kind of makes the victim out of us, like we're victims. But we're not victims. We're victorious. I mean, we're, we're, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You and I can, we're on the winning side. That's what I'm saying. We're on the winning side. And so, yes, we do have a responsibility. Yes, there is a work for us to complete. The church, yes, we're here for help, to help people, and we do that. But I don't, wanna, I don't want Yakota Baptist Church to get into this mentality that we're just victims. Because we're not victims. We are blessed of God. Called of God. Commissioned. Hallelujah by the Son of God, to do something for the cause of Christ. Others say, well, you know, the Christians have work to complete, maybe, but I'm just so busy. I just don't have time to do anything. Uh, with work, with school, with 
uh, whatever. I just, uh, kids, I just don't have time to do anything for God. And therefore, they say, I, well, no, I don't have any responsibility. I don't have a work to do. But I say, yes, you do have a work to do. Uh, yes, we do have something to complete. While you're here at Yakota, I believe we all have a work to complete. And the Bible says over and over, redeeming the time. A redeeming the time. Wake up. Uh, you know, we have, uh, each of us have 24 hours in a day. And uh, we all have the same amount of time, and God wants us to take that time and to redeem it and use it to serve Him. Jesus said in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things, they'll be added unto you. God will take care of all those things. But first of all, seek God. Others will say, well, you know, I, does a Christian have really a work to do? Well, I don't know. I just, I have no ability. Maybe some people have work to do, and maybe God calls them to do something, but I'm just unable. I don't have any abilities. And to that we reply, uh, that sounds um, like Moses. <laughs> I've been reading Moses. When God called Moses, Moses said, no, nah, you don't want, I mean, there's, you, just, you there's got to be, uh, hey, I can't even talk. I, I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of the tongue. I, I can't talk. And God says, Moses, who made man's mouth? <laughs> who made man's mouth? Have not I the Lord? And he reminded them that he will take you and use you. And, and we say, well, I don't have any ability. Well, I, will re I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians, Paul specifically said God chooses that kind of person. He chooses the weak. He chooses the... He doesn't choose the, the mighty. He doesn't choose the brilliant ones. He chooses just, just the people that are just available. And he uses them, God uses them to confound the world. And he takes that person who's, you know, yeah, I don't have any ability, I can't do anything. God takes that person and uses them and his servant and he wins people to Christ. And he uh, disciples people. And he shows that man is not to glory in man. That if any man is going to glory, let it glory in the Lord. And God takes uh, folks and uses them uh, that way. So yes, does a Christian have a work to do? Do we have uh, a work to complete? I say absolutely. And I don't know what your work is. Uh, you, that's, that's between you and the Lord. I only say I know you have a work because if you're saved here tonight, the Holy Spirit has gifted you at least one gift, but I believe probably more than one gift. And God has gifted you, and he wants to take you and use you in this local assembly to do whatever he's gifted you. And just do it with all your might. He's, God, I know, has called me to preach, so I'm going to preach. <laughs> That's all I know to do. God's called me to preach, so I'm going to preach as faithfully as I can uh, with the grace of God and, and with his help. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach. Because that's what God's called me to do. And now you have to do whatever God's called you to do. And just do it. Do it. Does a Christian have a, uh, a work to complete? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that one day we can say like Paul, I have finished my course. Uh, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call. And you know, the Bible teaches that one day we're all going to give account. for what did we do? The fact that we're going to have to give an account implies we've got something to do. If we don't have anything to do, what? Well, I know you don't have to give an account. I didn't ask you to do anything, so no. You, but it says then every one of us shall give account uh, of what we did. And I, I, I like Paul and Barnabas. They, for the work which they fulfilled, they did it. And God help us just to get alone with him, walk with him, and do what God wants you to do. The will of God is not distant, it's daily. And you know, in the times where you're still, I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, here's five things you can do. And I preach it all the time. But you do these five things uh, and you wait on the Lord. Number one, read your Bible every day. Read, your, read the Word of God. Two, pray. Spend time in prayer. I, I like to read the Bible. When I read something I, and it speaks to my heart, I stop right there and I talk to God about it. That's praying. And ask God for things. Three, tithe your income. Tithe your income. Do that. Whatever God gives you, take a tenth of that, at least a tenth of that, and give it. And God loves a cheerful giver, so might as well just give 90%. <laughs> just, 
But I do know one guy did that, and he became a multimillionaire. But he decided he was going to tithe 90%. <laughs> um, he was a special, a large equipment operator. I can't, J.R. Letourneau, I think was his name, Letourneau. He decided he was going to give 90% and keep 10 and he became a millionaire, multi-millionaire. But read your Bible, pray, tithe your income, go to church, be in church. I mean, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Just be there. Use going to church as an encouragement. You can be encouragement to other people. And when you, It's not all about you. I mean, Paul and Barnabas, they went back to them. They were strengthening and they were confirming and exhorting one another. And God wants to use you here in this place because people need encouragement, do we not? We go through tough times and things don't work out like we think and I've got stresses here and this ain't going right. And it might just be God's going to use you, put a little grin on your face and shake a brother or sister's hand and say, bro, good to see you. you know, that, God will work in your heart. Read your Bible, pray, tithe your income, go to church, and finally be a witness. Tell somebody. Pass out a gospel tract. On the way out tonight, grab a Put them in your pocket, or I would suggest getting a man purse if you're a man. Good thing. <laughs> Still no? Still no. All right. <laughs> backpack, right, right. Get you a backpack and put some tracks in them. Furlough time, yeah. But, and look for opportunities. Pass, I mean, just pass gospel tracks out to everybody you see and take the opportunities that God gives you to witness to people. And do those things. Do, does a Christian uh, have a work to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. And these guys here um, then sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. Are you fulfilling the work God's called you to do? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, help us, Lord, to realize that you have a work for us to do, that you've called us and gifted each and every one of us uh, to do something as members of your body here on earth. And God, help us to fulfill that. Help us, Lord, to be busy and to put priority where you would put priority on our lives, Lord. And may we seek to please you. We ask that you'll bless this time of invitation. Help us to just simply draw closer to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.